tell me a bit about John Cage in relation to percussion writing. He was very poor and wanted, as young composers want to, he wanted to get his music played, so he went out and collected a lot of instruments, and, they, and he was interested in percussion sounds, in unusual sounds. So he collected drums, bits of metal, old bathtubs, things like that. Some of them were similar to Balinese instruments, some were similar to African instruments, things he couldn't afford. He just put them all together and made an orchestra of sounds out of them. Do you think this business of found objects was a very important part of his philosophy? I think it certainly was at the time. Um, what's interesting, in particularly third construction, is this link between the found instruments. There's, there's uh, 20 tin cans in there and all things like that. And he's also very specific about some very strange things, like uh, there is a Northwest Indian rattle in there. I'm afraid I've got no idea what a Northwest Indian rattle is. We just sort of have um, various kinds of rattles for the various ones that he's asked for. But he is very specific about some things and other things he clearly just... I don't care. You know, just, just make, make a sound that's metallic here. The cricket callers are, are just lengths of bamboo and you've got, to, you've got to slit at one end and sort of snap it until you reach a joint. When you hit that, the two sides just gently wobble and you get a, a, a buzzing sound. And the conch shell, you get an ordinary conch shell, just go to a normal seashell shop. Of course, and, of which uh, there are <laughs> millions. You can't move inland. And you just cut the end off, chisel a bit out of the end, and it becomes a sort of trumpet mouthpiece. We put our own feeling into the piece, so where he specified tom-toms, we've decided to use our own sort of drums. I myself use congas in the piece. Richard uses African drums. So, and Stephen uses bongos. Just to give the different different sort of sounds from around the world. I, I presume there's a lot of uh, instruments now available to you that wouldn't have been around 50 years ago, and you need to, opposite of authenticity, I mean, yes. you want to take the piece with you into the future <coughs> rather than go backwards. Yeah, um, like I mean, the, the tom-toms, another good example, they would have been a, a very thick-shelled, calf-skinned instruments, which we don't, just don't use anymore. Um, I just can't get hold of them anyway. Or, or if you do use them when it rains, the skin goes floppy, and it, <laughs> it sounds, sounds like you're playing on the carpet or something like that. <laughs> and there's probably a huge difference in the tin cans they had then. I mean, we yeah. use very sort of big paint tins or large Nescafe jars, which are very good. I don't know whether I should say that, really. <laughs> but probably the, the kind of tin cans they had in the 40s were not at all the same as they are now. Perhaps they were better. I don't know. So you think there's a place for the authentic performance of, you know, <laughs> those, that 40s tin can? Maybe we could go, go, go through a, a modern art museum and take a few of Andy Warhol's cans <laughs> and, and play on those. Maybe they wouldn't... Maybe that would be be a rather offensive thing to do. Thank you. 